The Sound of Waves, Chapter 11. While they were eating their lunch the next day on the Dahai Maru, the master opened his tobacco pouch and took out a piece of paper folded very small. Grinning broadly, he held it out to Shinji. But when Shinji reached for it, Jukichi said, Now listen, if I give you this, will you promise not to start loafing around after you've read it? I'm not that sort of fellow, Shinji replied, definitely and to the point. All right, it's a man's promise. This morning, when I was passing Uncle Teru's house, Hatsu came trotting out and pressed this note tight in my hand. She didn't say a word and went right back inside. I was tickled to think of getting a love letter at my age, but then I opened it, and how should it begin but, Dear Shinji, <laughs> you old fool, I told myself, and I was just about to tear it up and throw it in the ocean. But then I told myself that would be a shame, so I brought it along for you. Shinji took the note, while both the master and Ryuji laughed. The thin paper had been folded many times into a small pellet, and Shinji opened it gingerly, careful not to tear it in his thick, knobby fingers. Tobacco dust sifted onto his hands from the folds. She'd started writing on the notepaper with ink, but after a few lines her fountain pen had apparently run dry and she had continued with a faint pencil. Written in a childish hand, the note said, Last night, at the bath, father heard some very bad gossip about us and became terribly angry and commanded that I must never see Shinji-san again. No matter how much I explained, it was no use, not with father's being the kind of man he is. He says I must never go out of the house from the time the fishing boats come back in the afternoon until after they've gone out in the morning. He says he'll get the lady next door to draw water for us when our turn comes so there's nothing I can do. I'm so miserable, so very miserable, I can't stand it. And he says that on the days when the boats don't go out, he'll be right at my side and never take his eyes off me. How will I ever be able to see Shinji-san again? Please think of some way for us to meet. I'm afraid for us to send letters by mail because the old postmaster would know all about it. So every day I'll write a letter and stick it under the lid on the water jar in front of our kitchen. Please put your replies in the same place. But it would be dangerous for you to come here yourself to get the letters. So please get some friend you trust to come for you. I've been on the island such a short time that I don't know anybody I can really trust. Oh, Shinji-san, let us go on truly, with strong hearts. Every day I will be praying before the memorial tablets of my mother and brother that no accident will befall Shinji-san. I'm sure that they in heaven will understand how I feel. As Shinji read the note, the expression on his face alternated, like sunshine and shadow between the sorrow of being separated from Hatsu and the joy of having this proof of her affection for him. Just as Shinji finished reading the note, Jukichi snatched it out of his hands, as though this were only the rightful due of a bearer of love messages, and read it through. Not only did he read it aloud for Ryuji's benefit, but he also read it in his own unique, ballad-chanting style. Shinji knew that Jukichi always read the newspaper aloud to himself in the same chanting tone, and that he was using it now without the slightest malice. But still, it hurt to have such a travesty made of those earnest words written by the girl he loved. As a matter of fact, Jukichi was sincerely moved by the letter, and, during the reading, he heaved many a big sigh and threw in many an interjection. When he was done, he gave his opinion in the same powerful voice he used to give fishing orders a voice that now boomed out over the quiet noonday sea to a radius of a hundred yards in all directions. Women really are wise ones, aren't they? Here in the boat, there were none to hear except these two whom he trusted. So at Jukichi's urging, Shinji gradually confided in them. His way of telling the story was awkward. Events were often told in the wrong order, and he would leave out important points. It took him quite a time just to give a brief outline. Finally, he reached the heart of the matter and told them how, on that day of the storm, even though they were naked in each other's arms, he had been unable to win the prize after all. At this point, Jukichi, who almost never smiled, couldn't stop laughing. If it had been me, oh, if it had been me, really, what a mess you made of things. But then I guess that's what comes of you being such a virgin. 
And, besides, the girl's so almighty straight-laced that she was too big a handful for you. But still, it's a ridiculous story. Oh well. It'll be alright after she's your wife. Then you'll make up for it by giving her the rod ten times a day. Ryuji, a year younger than Shinji, was listening to this talk as though he only half understood it. As for Shinji, he wasn't sensitive and easily wounded the way a city-bred boy is during the time of his first love. And to Shinji, the old man's raillery was actually soothing and comforting rather than upsetting. The gentle waves that rocked their boat also calmed his heart, and now that he had told the whole story, he was at peace. This place of toil had become for him a place of matchless rest. Ryuji, who passed Terukichi's house on his way to the beach, volunteered to pick up Hatsu's letter from under the lid of the water jar each morning. So from tomorrow, you'll be the new postmaster, said Chukichi, making one of his rare jokes. The daily letters became the principal subject of conversation during their lunch hours on the boat, and the three of them always shared the anguish and the anger called forth by the contents of the letters. The second letter in particular aroused their indignation. In it, Hatsu described at length how Yasuo had attacked her by the spring in the middle of the night and the threats he had made. She had kept her promise and not told about it, but Yasuo had avenged himself by spreading that false story about her and Shinji through the village. Then, when her father had forbidden her to see Shinji again, she had explained everything honestly and had also told him of Yasuo's disgraceful behaviour. But her father hadn't done a thing about Yasuo, had, in fact, even remained on as friendly terms as ever with the Yasuo's family, with the same visiting back and forth. But she herself detested the very sight of Yasuo's face. She ended the letter by assuring Shinji that she would never, never let her guard down against Yasuo. Ryuji became excited on Shinji's behalf, and even Shinji's eyes flashed with a rare expression of anger. It's all because I'm poor, Shinji said. He was usually not one to let such querulous words pass his lips, and he felt tears of shame springing in his eyes, not because he was poor, but because he had been weak enough to give voice to such a complaint. But then he tightened his face with all his might, defying those unexpected tears, and managed to avoid the double shame of having the others see him cry. This time, Jukichi didn't laugh. Jukichi took great pleasure in tobacco and had the odd habit of alternating between a pipe one day and cigarettes the next. Today was the turn for cigarettes. On pipe days, he was forever knocking his tiny, old-fashioned brass pipe against the side of the boat, a habit that had worn a small trough in a certain spot on the gunwale. It was because he prized his ship so greatly that he had decided to forgo his pipe every other day and smoke New Life cigarettes instead, carving himself a coral holder for the purpose. Chikichi turned his eyes away from the two youths and, the coral holder clamped between his teeth, gazed out over the misty expanse of the Gulf of Eyes. Cape Moro, at the tip of the Cheetah Peninsula, was faintly visible through the mist. Chikichi Oyama's face was like leather. The sun had burned it almost black down to the very bottom of its deep wrinkles and it gleamed like polished leather. His eyes were sharp and full of life, but they'd lost the clarity of youth and, in its place, seemed to have been glazed with the same tough dirt that coated his skin, making them able to withstand any light, no matter how brilliant. Because of his age and his great experience as a fisherman, he knew how to wait tranquilly. Now, he said, I know exactly what you two are thinking. You're planning to give Yasuo a beating. But you listen to me. That won't do a bit of good. A fool's a fool, so just leave him alone. Guess it's hard for Shinji, but patience is the main thing. That's what it takes to catch a fish. Everything's going to be all right now for sure. Right's sure to win, even if it doesn't say anything. Uncle Teru's no fool, and don't you ever think he can't tell a fresh fish from a rotten one. Just you leave Yasuo alone. Right's sure to win in the end. Even though it was always a day late, village gossip reached the lighthouse together together with the daily deliveries of mail and food. And the news that Terukichi had forbidden Hatsu to see Shinji turned Chiyoko's heart black with feelings of guilt. She comforted herself with the thought that Shinji didn't know she was the source of this false gossip. But even so, she simply couldn't look Shinji in the eye when he came one day to bring fish, completely cast down in spirits. 
and on the other hand her good-natured parents, not knowing the reason, were worried over Chioko's moroseness. Chioko's spring vacation was drawing to a close and the day came when she was to return to her dormitory in Tokyo. She simply couldn't bring herself to confess what she had done, and yet she had the feeling that she couldn't return to Tokyo until she asked Shinji to forgive her. If she didn't confess her guilt, there was no particular reason for Shinji to be angry with her, but still she wanted to beg his pardon. So she got herself invited to spend the night before her departure for Tokyo at the house of the postmaster in the village, and before dawn the next morning she went out alone. The beach was already busy with preparations for the day's fishing, and people were going about their work in the starlight. The boats, pulled on the abacus frames and urged on by many shouting voices, inched reluctantly down toward the water's edge. Nothing could be seen distinctly except the white of the towels and sweat cloths the men had tied around their heads. Step by step, Chioko's wooden clogs sank into the cold sand and in its turn the sand slithered whisperingly off the arches of her feet. Everyone was busy, and no one looked at Chiyoko. She realised with a pang of shame that here all these people were, caught fast in the monotonous but powerful whirlpool of earning a daily living, burning out the very depths of their bodies and souls, and that not one of them was the sort of person who could become engrossed in sentimental problems such as hers. Nevertheless, Chioko peered eagerly through the dawn's darkness, looking for Shinji. All the men were dressed alike, and it was difficult to distinguish their faces in the morning twilight. One boat finally hit the waves and floated on the water as though it had been freed from cramped confinement. Instinctively, Chioko moved toward it and then called out to a young man with a white towel tied around his head. The youth had been about to jump aboard, but now he stopped and turned back. His smiling face revealed the whiteness of two clean rows of teeth, and Shioko knew for certain it was Shinji. I'm leaving today. I wanted to say goodbye. Oh, you're leaving? Shinji fell silent, and then in an unnatural tone of voice, as though he were trying to decide what would be best to say, he added, Well, goodbye. Shinji was in a hurry. Realising this, Chioko felt even more hurried than he. No words would come much less a confession. She closed her eyes, praying that Shinji would stay before her even one second more. In this moment, she realised that her wanting to beg his pardon was actually nothing but a mask to conceal her long-felt desire to have him be kind to her. What was it she was wanting to be forgiven for? This girl who was so convinced of her ugliness. On the spur of the moment, without thought, she let slip the question she had always kept pushed down in the very bottom of her heart a question she probably could never have asked anyone but this one boy. Shinji, am I so ugly? What? the boy asked, a puzzled look on his face. My face, is it so ugly? Chiyoko hoped the dawn's darkness would protect her face, making her appear even the slightest bit beautiful. But the sea to the east, didn't it seem to be already turning light? Shinji's answer was immediate. Being in a hurry, he escaped a situation in which too slow an answer would have cut into the girl's heart. What makes you say that? You're pretty, he said, one hand on the stern and one foot already beginning to leap that would carry him into the boat. You're pretty. As everyone well knew, Shinji was incapable of flattery. Now, pressed for time, he'd simply given a felicitous answer to her urgent question. The boat began to move. He waved back to her cheerfully from the boat as it pulled away, and it was a happy girl who was left standing at the water's edge. Later that morning, her parents came down from the lighthouse to see her off, and even while she talked with them, Chiyoko's face was full of life. They were surprised to see how happy their daughter was to be returning to Tokyo. The kamikaze Maru pulled away from the jetty, and Chiyoko was finally alone on the warm deck. In the solitude, her feeling of happiness on which she had been pondering constantly all morning, became complete. He said, I'm pretty, he said, I'm pretty. Chioko repeated yet again the refrain she had said over and over to herself, how many hundreds of times since that moment. That's really what he said, and that's enough for me. I mustn't expect more than that. That's really what he said to me. I must be satisfied with that and not expect him to love me too. He, he has someone else to love. 
What a wicked thing it was I did to him. What terrible unhappiness my jealousy has caused him. And yet he repaid my wickedness by saying I'm pretty. I must make it up to him. Somehow I must do whatever I can to return his kindness. Chiyoko's reveries were broken by a strange sound of singing that drifted across the waves. When she looked, she saw a fleet of boats covered with red banners sailing from the direction of the Irako Channel. What are those? Chiyoko asked the captain's young assistant who was coiling a hawser on the deck. They're pilgrim boats bound for the Ai's shrines. The fishermen from around Enshu and Yotsu on Suruga Bay bring their families with them on the Benito boats to Toba. All those red flags have the boats' names on them. They have a great time drinking and singing and gambling all the way. The red banners became more and more distinct, and as the fast ocean-going fishing boats drew near the Kamikaze Maru, the singing voices borne on the wind were almost raucous. Once more, Chioka repeated to herself, He told me I'm pretty, 